Okay, uh, so here's a basic, basic outline. In the last section, um, it's unnecessarily technical and has a bunch of plots, and so we'll just look at the pictures in that one. Uh, we'll, and, uh, we'll get there when we get there. Okay. Um, so again, I don't know a lot of cosmology, but fortunately, Professor Douglas has already covered a, a great deal of this. Um, and so I'm just going through the, a number of bullet points here. Um, the energy density of the vacuum is going to re, uh, receive these contributions from how the compactification of the extra manifolds are going to couple to these matter uh, modes. And uh, I guess the, the, if there's any overarching feature of, of what I'm going to claim is that there are an extremely large number of such modes uh, more than is necessary to actually realize the cosmological constant um, through some kind of landscape model. And so the fact that there are more modes or more fields or more fluxes available changes the nature of the underlying mathematical problem. Okay, and so that's the, the sort of bottom line up front, so to speak. Okay, so uh, in such a landscape mod, mod uh, in a model, uh, the universe is going to contain a large number of regions, as we just saw a few minutes ago. Uh, a typical region might have cosmological constant that's of order one Planck unit, and therefore there's not going to be any computation that's, that can happen in that causal region. Uh, we'll necessarily find ourselves in a causal region with relatively small uh, cosmological constant. I say relatively on purpose there because, as we'll see later, uh, the mathematical problem that underpins it would suggest that our cosmological constant should be way smaller in, than that. And so, uh, to, in, in such a model, uh, and again, I don't really follow this last statement, um, the, it's going to be consistent if, if neighboring uh, vacua have very different energies, and that will correspond in some sense to the flipping of a sign of one of these modes. Uh, we're going to talk about a very specific model, and then that will uh, create a very small, uh, from a very small cosmological constant, uh, a larger one, uh, one that's uh, size O of 1. And so the, the models that we have are built upon the fact that we're going to sum together a variety of mathematical objects, the goal of which that there is that they'll cancel in just the right way to produce something very, very small. So that's going to be the overpinning mathematical construction that we'd like to examine. Okay, so, uh, so these, uh, when we wrote this paper, which was not long ago, we only really thought about two models, and in fact, uh, we really have only focused on the ADK model, which I've cited up here. Um, the Busovchensky model, uh, Professor Douglas mentioned quite a bit. Um, so in the, in the model that we're going to look at, the cosmological constant is going to be realized in exactly this way by summing together a variety of fields. Now, we're even going to focus on a simplification of this model to make the, the problem even easier to state. Uh, each of these fields is going to be similar to like a double well potential. And the energy gaps between the two wells are going to be something on the order of a Planck unit. Okay, so in the actual model itself, there's a bias there, so, so that, uh, that the energy is not going to be mean zero. But ultimately, that's just going to create an offset for our problem. So it, it does actually complicate the analysis a little bit and make the formulas more complicated, but that's not the point that I'd like to make now. And so I'm going to assume that uh, these fields are mean zero. And so to compute a cosmological constant, a putative co cosmological constant, off of a collection of in such fields, uh, we're going to select one of these and sum up the corresponding energies. And as such, it looks like uh, one of these subset sum problems or something, if you, if you like, a weighted subset sum. All right, so that's going to be the basis for what we're going to look at. Now, indeed, if we phrase this in the correct way, uh, this is going to boil down to something called the number partitioning problem. And indeed, the number partitioning problem is one of these classical examples of an NP-complete problem. And so to find a, uh, these, a solution to this number partitioning problem, which minimizes the, uh, the sum of the weights in each of the parts, um, you know, that's going to require typically an exponential amount of work. I mean, it is an NP-complete problem. All of the known algorithms for doing that are exponential. Um, uh, however, you know, what's, how are we going to codify it? I mean, I want to make some, some concrete statements. Um, what's, what's our work? What are we allowed to, to access when we say we're solving one of these problems? And so there's two views of this, sort of the global view, um, which was just presented. Uh, namely, the universe has these, these ever-expanding regions. 
Um, in these regions, the gravity is going to provide us resources in terms of the integral of the action over the region. Um, and being complex entities, uh, we're naturally going to find ourselves in a region that has a, uh, a small cosmological constant. Um, alternatively, one consider a local view where we're talking about specific decay chains of the energy through space-time. Um, when, uh, when one of these things uh, decoheres, when a, when a vacuum transition takes place. And so we necessarily find ourselves in a surviving chain at the end. Um, hmm, great. Uh, both of those give us some resources uh, that we can work with in terms of computation. Uh, you know, I, I don't, this was, this statement was quite contentious when, while we were writing it. Um, and uh, based on the comments that we got, it was even more contentious afterwards. And so uh, I'll, I'll let you read this. This is the verbiage that we used in the paper, more or less. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a form of, of church Turing thesis, I suppose. Um, namely, we're saying that whatever we uh, achieve at the end of a computation, when we make a measurement, that uh, what nature did is ultimately um, computable. Okay, so the resources that nature had to produce such a solution um, limits what it could have computed. Uh, again, here's a, a number of citations. I don't think we need to go through this again. Um, we've just seen this. Uh, so, based on the fact that um, we have these number of resources, say, by, by looking at the, the action, um, the number of gates that we have available to us in a region with cosmological constant lambda is going to be on the order of lambda inverse. And so, for the problems that we're interested in, that's something like 10 to the 120. Uh, so... You know, paradox, well, I don't know, maybe that's a strong statement. Um, in many ways, this, uh, this computational censorship or something like that, saying that we can't use more resources than we had available, uh, computation of the cosmological constant is possibly the worst example one could use because the number of resources available and the cost of computing something related to it, of course, are going to be using the same thing. Okay, so, so that's not a great example. Um, if we do, for instance, just brute force search, and I'll go ahead and derive this a little bit later, uh, we find that the, the work cost is effectively the inverse cosmological constant up to this you know, polylog factor. And you know, what's a polylog factor among friends, right? And so, yeah, maybe paradox, maybe not paradox, you know, exchange rates and such and such between resources. Maybe we can sweep that under the rug. Uh, but I think the important point to recognize here is this is built upon the idea, uh, at least in the model that we're going to look at, that the number of fields in this case for this model um, is at exactly the right number to produce the cosmological constant as the optimal solution. Okay, if the number of fields is larger than that, then the problem behaves differently, much like a SAT problem. I mean, so I think it was decided yesterday that 3 SAT has to be everybody's favorite MP-complete problem. Um, and so if I write down a random 3SAT problem, you say, well, it's hard, but that's just not the case. Okay, so I look at the ratio of clauses to variables, and if it's over the threshold, I say there's no solution. If it's under the threshold, I say there is, and there's a very good chance I'm right. So to get, uh, to get problems that are actually hard, you have to be tuned right at that phase transition to actually realize these difficult problems. And the same sort of thing here with number partitioning is if the number of numbers and the size of the numbers, if you will, aren't precisely tuned to each other, the problems really aren't that difficult. Okay, and so that's, uh, that's the big takeaway here. All right, so in particular, when the number of fields for this model gets very large uh, with respect to the size of the residue, if you will, that we're attempting to produce, then the problems aren't as difficult. There are heuristics that will produce that. Okay, so polynomial time heuristics, in fact, the carmarker carp algorithm will spend some time uh, looking at. And so uh, I, I went ahead and computed it out. Uh, the cost of the car marker carp is going to be sub-exponential. And so, you know, for any reasonably sized number lambda, where there's no paradox with respect to resources that I need to compute it. All right, so uh, in fact, my minor contribution to this paper was this last bullet point here. Uh, Civ algorithms, they are exponential but uh, they have very, very favorable constants in those exponentials. And so, in fact, there's a reasonable 
assumption point here that not only could uh, the universe compute it, but there's a very good chance that we can do these problems now. Okay, so, uh, so we actually did the Karmarker Karp algorithm on, uh, well, on my desktop and then later on a cluster. Um, I will give an example of a sieve, which I didn't want to do on my, <laughs> my laptop. But uh, you know, if, if it was absolutely necessary that we had to, to compute the solution, uh, yeah, we could have. It's, it wouldn't have been that bad. OK. So the relationship between the model and the number partitioning algorithm is relatively straightforward. Um, we have to be a little bit careful because when we phrase uh, problems in complexity theory or what, we'd like to have um, you know, finite input. We don't want to say you input real numbers of you know, arbitrarily large precision. And so the number partitioning problem is usually stated in terms of given a number of uh, positive integers, compute a partition, some of which get a positive coefficient, some of which get a negative coefficient, so that the cancel as best as we can. Right, there's going to be a little parity issue when the, uh, when the sum of the numbers is even versus odd. They may not cancel perfectly. Uh, if their sum is odd, the best you can hope for is plus or minus one, and so that's why I have that strange equation there. Finding, the, uh, finding vacuum in the NDK model is similar. We look at the energy difference between the, the two minima in this double well potential. That's going to be some real number, but the formula for what the cosmological constant is is basically the same kind of formula. You uh, have a sign plus or minus attached to each one of these energy differences, and so really formally the only difference is in, uh, in the model, we're dealing with summing up real numbers and we want to cancel them to a certain precision versus in the number partitioning problem where we're just given numbers of the, of the specified size and we want to produce a perfect partition, which means we partition them to have some zero or plus or minus one depending on the case. All right, so, uh, so let's talk about this phase transition for a moment. Um, if I give you a random instance of, of uh, number partitioning, it really requires two parameters. The number of numbers, uh, so in our model that will be in, versus the magnitude of where these numbers are coming from. And so I'll call that capital B. A little bit later I'll use little b as the log of that. That will also play a role. So uh, depending on whether the, the sum of the numbers is even or odd, a perfect partition is going to cancel. Uh, precisely, uh, giving a result of 0 or 1. And this size parameter b is going to govern the likelihood that we're going to be able to find perfect partitions or not for random problems in exactly the same way that the ratio of clauses to variables does for SAT problems. Namely, if my size of numbers is sufficiently large, slightly larger than 2 to the n, then uh, we won't find any perfect partitions. The problem will be overdetermined in a sense. Whereas if b is smaller than 2 to the n, there's likely to be exponentially many partitions. And, uh, and fine. OK, great. So uh, in particular, if b is really small, namely basically the size of the largest number, uh, you know, the, the OK, uh, if it's only polynomial in the number of numbers that I give, then, um, then in fact, just a simple dynamic program will solve these. And you can peel this out of one of any number of textbooks. Okay, so again, the, depending on what the size of the two parameters are with respect to each other, the problems may be very easy. Now, we're sort of interested in the other end, um, namely when n gets very, very large, um, then, then how difficult are, can these problems be? All right, so in terms of just doing brute force, brute force search, this is where the supposed paradox lies. Um, here we think about the number of numbers which are independently drawn from 0, 1, uh, so this is from the ADK model. And our goal is to cancel off, say, um, 120 digits uh, of precision out of each of these numbers by choosing whether they have a plus or minus sign in the appropriate partition. Okay, so um, there's been literature. Um, oh, I didn't cite it on this page. It's on the next, it's on the next slide. Uh, so it, it, when we compute the optimal partitioning, what is the result of that? Well, the residue, if the, if the things are drawn uniform, are good, is going to be around the size 2 to the minus n. 
Okay, you can think of, uh, there's two to the minus n possible configurations, so I can choose the signs appropriately, and therefore I would expect to cancel around n bits of information, and then the root n comes from a sort of random walk type argument. Right, so uh, we would expect to see a solution around that size, and so as long as that size is smaller than the cosmological constant I'm attempting to produce, I expect to be able to find it. And so what's the relationship between n and lambda that we have to have satisfied? Well, it's right here in sort of scales like uh, log inverse cosmological constant plus a log log term. And the precision is going to be uh, as stated because that's what we have to cancel. So if I give you a problem and say, how would I enumerate such a, such an, um, what, what's the cost of just doing brute force enumeration for such a problem? Well, I'm going to guess over the two to the n possible configurations. And uh, you know, for lack of a better thing, I'm just going to use ordinary arithmetic to say what the cost is of computing the sums and differences. Okay, and so that would give a, a cost of enumeration, something like n to the n with a b in there because we need b bits of precision. Uh, we can drop that leading in by doing something a little clever. Um, I, yeah. Well, let me just put, uh, I don't need to say that. I don't want to spend time on it. Um, the idea here is just to use a gray code. If, I, if I'm clever about the way that I enumerate the things, I don't recompute them every time. I just change the sign on one element. And that allows me to, uh, to save this log factor. All right, so if you go through the arithmetic, uh, we find that, that yields a complexity of lambda inverse plus a polylog term. And that was the, the origin, if you will, of that, that paradox, that polylog factor in there. But this is a number partitioning problem, and so there are far better things to, one can do. Um, again, if the number of fields is significantly larger than what we need to produce a cosmological constant, so in other words, if I have more than 400 fields, say I have, uh, I go within a 78,000 or, you know, as the case may be, 80 million fields, uh, so 80 million cycles in our well, okay, this is a different model, I would say. So for whatever reason, we have that many, many fields available to us. Then heuristic algorithms will produce uh, solutions, if you will, of the right size. Now, they're not going to be a solutions because I'm only going to be able to approximate the smallest possible residue. But the approximation factor is good enough that I will be able to find something of the size of the cosmological constant. Okay, so... You know, here's some dynamics. This is actually, you know, as you're reading, what the, uh, what the Karmarker Karp algorithm does. Uh, it's very, very simple. You just sort the numbers, you subtract the two largest to get a, a difference, and you reinsert that into the list and keep going until you run out of numbers. Okay, simplest thing in the, in the world. Um, now, why should that be, have anything related to the dynamics of what's going on? Well, it isn't. I mean, there's, there's absolutely no reason to think it should. Um, all we're stating here is that when the number of fields and the precision one's attempting to do, uh, attempting to work with, aren't precisely balanced, then simple heuristics can actually realize something more interesting. That, that's, that's all I'm attempting to say here. And so the complexity of this algorithm is in log n, basically going through the n numbers, doing an insert at every stage. That's, that's basically it. Okay, so the cost then applied to the problem is gonna be something relatively straightforward. Um, uh, oh, I sort of did not put this slide in the order that I wanted, but I guess that's okay. Um, so uh, let's sort of read from the bottom up, if you will. Um, no, no, okay, this is fine, this is fine. Uh, so if the number of fields is much, much larger than the sort of minimum number of fields I need to produce a cosmological constant of the size I want, uh, then I can apply this karmarker karp algorithm and compute it. It will find an approximate minimum, uh, but it's not going to find the absolute minimum. What it's going to do is it's going to reduce the typical size, the size of a typical element, um, by a factor of e to minus log squared of n. There's a coefficient in front of there. Um, no, this is... Yeah, this is, certainly, this is an average case because we're talking about random problems here. Yeah, so this is this completely average case, that's right. And so the initial numbers are drawn uniformly at random between zero and one, average case analysis. Okay, so... Uh, Wait, but does Karmaker Karp have a worst case guarantee? 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, it has to have something, you're right, but, but it's not going to be this. <laughs> it's going to be something else entirely, yeah, yeah. Right, so, uh, and so yeah, an average case, we're going to see, uh, and we'll, we'll actually plot some pictures at the very end of what we're looking at. Uh, we see a reduction in the size of our, our fields by this factor, e to the minus c log squared n. Uh, this c is uh, known by doing statistical mechanics methods to be uh, something around 1 over root 2. And so the number of fields that's necessary is going to be sub-exponential in, in the log of the target cosmological constant that we're aiming at. Okay, so an interesting point that we'll see in a moment is uh, yeah, these, are, these are really big numbers we're talking about, you know, 800 million and something like that. So you might assume that since we're not dealing with n to be like 5, 10, 20, or whatever, that we ought to be pretty close to this constant c. We ought to be into the asymptotic regime if we're analyzing problems big enough to deal with the cosmological constant. It's not true. We're nowhere near the asymptotic regime yet. And so it's, it's not really fair to even talk about, well, asymptotically we're getting close by examining problems of size. We aren't. We're just not there. And so we can estimate what the, what the c we're going to use is, and it's, it's uh, you know, 10% shy of where it should be. Okay, so uh, interesting sideline. All right, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about sieves. And so let me go back up to this top point here. Uh, exact algorithms, so ones that will, in fact, find the minimum residue, uh, they'll, they'll be exponential because they are, in fact, a, a tackling hard problems. And so the best known coefficient in that exponent, well, at least written um, in binary here, is like 0.241. OK, great. Uh, so in particular, if n is significantly larger than the cosmological constant, then we can't use these best algorithms. They're definitely going to violate this computational censorship. The, the work to use an exact algorithm is going to be much, much larger than the amount of resources in one of these causally connected domains. OK, so, so exact algorithms are right out. Nonetheless, uh, one can create algorithms um, that rely on these in a particular way. And so to explain how these sieves work, um, I, we need to talk just a little bit about how uh, th these exact algorithms behave. Um, there's actually huge literature on this. Um, number partitioning it is a very, very simple problem to state, but uh, its cousins, the subset sum problem and the knapsack problem, have cryptographic interest, and therefore they have a significantly larger literature. All right, so uh, if you're really interested in solving these problems, there are easily several hundred papers that can read through the, to examine these. Um, exact algorithms are going to be exponential. Uh, throughout the, the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on this very first one, um, which is just a meet-in-the-middle tree search, so a standard, standard meet-in-the-middle idea, um, simply because we actually wanted to do numerics, which had the unfortunate feature that I had to write code, which is generally a bad thing. Um, and therefore, the, if we wanted anything to work at all, it had to be the simplest thing imaginable. Uh, and so that's why uh, I dealt with the, with the very, very simple uh, horowitz sinai algorithm. Okay, the best known algorithms are very, very sophisticated. Uh, they use a concept called information set de uh, decoding, or um, cover, or any number of other, other names. Uh, the best known quantum algorithm is exactly one of these, an information set decoding algorithm with some amplitude amplification included along the way. Uh, and so you might think that this has absolutely nothing to do with what you might expect natural dynamics to behave. It's, it's very contrived to get such a, a good coefficient. Um, the adiabatic algorithm, yeah, okay. Uh, that might be realistic because we have tunneling events uh, between various configurations, which makes sense. Uh, but the coefficient is really, really hard to pin down. Uh, numerical studies of small things have indicated something smaller than one, which, you know, <laughs> anything in the adiabatic realm where you is better, smaller than one is a, is a good result. Okay, but um, even though these aren't going to apply to solve our big problems, we can use them to solve small problems. Okay, so if I supplement the model with a... Um, I uh, won't, won't call it a heuristic, but a, a concept that perhaps some of my fields will couple more frequently than others. That there's some secondary features that are going to cause some of the fields to uh, achieve local minima, uh, whereas other ones that are more weakly coupled will achieve local minima uh, among 
other fields that are more strongly coupled to them. And so uh, we'll have several stages of fields finding their local minima, and then the local minima finding local minima among those, et cetera. And that forms the basis of a sieve algorithm. So what we need to do is understand how the statistics of these optimal solutions behave in order that we can iterate this sieving idea. Okay, there's plenty of literature on this. Um, the result is that the optimal minima are close to this square root of b times 2 to the b. Now, b is going to be the size of the block I'm going to look at. So I'm going to look at b fields in a local neighborhood, if you will, where they're going to find a, a local minimum among themselves. Um, turns out that uh, for the numbers that we're interested in, uh, we're, since we're actually going to do this, um, with block size is about 20 to 50 fields finding the minimum, we can't, we're not far enough out to, to get this root b type behavior. Just a quick linear fit shows the exponent there is to be a little bit smaller than a half. Um, but the, the exponential decline, if you will, in the size of the residue as a function of the number of fields that are in a couple is, is apparent. Okay, so uh, there turns out to be a slight difference when you input numbers according to a uniform distribution, which is what our model does, versus input, inputting them with respect to an exponential distribution with mean one. Now I single that case out because the output of one of these sieves, one of these residues, is going to be exponentially distributed. And so the input to the next sieve isn't going to be uniform, it's going to be exponential. Its behavior is very similar, okay, but not quite as, quite as good. Okay, so here are, ah, oh, there we are. Okay, so actually those turned out somewhat better than I expected, which is a bit of a statement there. Um, so here are the, uh, a couple of plots of what the, um, what the size of the optimal residue is for some small number partitioning problems. Okay, so I plotted it in terms of the cumulative probability distribution of achieving a certain log size. So it's a strange, uh, strange way of, of presenting the data, but it's the one that was the easiest given, given the numerics, because I could just sort and plot. Uh, the, uh, so what we're seeing here, um, and I guess the, if there's any point to this, is there are actually four colors in each of these plots, the data and the model, but you can't see the model because the data is right on top of it. Okay, so, so they really are exhibiting exponential type behavior um, when I'm taking the solutions of number partitioning. Under, and it doesn't really make any difference which algorithm I'm using as long as it's an exact algorithm and it does find the optimal one. And okay, then it's gonna have this kind of scaling behavior. All right, so let's put these together into a sieve. Okay, so um, I have a, like a couple minutes. Uh, the, where these sieves came from is, uh, is actually from the lattices. And so when we started this, I was, I was thinking more about the uh, Busopolchensky model. Um, but uh, I don't remember exactly what led us to focus on, on the number partitioning problem. And so uh, one of the first things I did was I'll just adapt some of these well-known sieving techniques to number partitioning. Okay, so it turns out that uh, Carmarker CARP is a really, really good algorithm. I thought these sieves would be able to beat it easily. Eh, they don't come close. Okay, but, uh, but they're still actually quite efficient. So, so what is a sieve? Um, well, it, it's something you put your pasta into to drain the water out, right? And so it's, a, it's exactly that sort of thing. It's, we're going to take a bunch of data, we're going to put it into the sieve, and out the bottom comes something better. Okay, that's, that's really all there is to it, is a conceptual thing. Um, here, uh, in this concept, and in the lattice sieves, same sort of thing. Uh, yep? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'd think. <laughs> so uh, I'll blame the English language on that one. Uh. <laughs> so, um, so here what we're going to do is we're going to partition our input into small problems. So this is the concept that certain fields are going to couple to each other strong, more strongly than they are to other fields. That's going to determine our block sizes and how we partition our fields up. We're going to use an exact algorithm to find the optimum over that block. And so since these blocks are going to be small, one would, that doesn't require a lot of work. And so even if we're talking about natural dynamics, that would happen relatively quickly. Okay. Then uh, each one of those subproblems is going to output uh, some residue, which is some number, which is going to be the input to the next problem. We're going to repeat this multiple times. Okay, so uh, 
it's kind of interesting is that we're really solving the same problem. We're just solving it on increasingly smaller length scales. Okay, until we get down to the, the scale that we want, which in this case is the size of the cosmological constant. Okay. All right, so as if this wasn't clear, I have a, a slide, which I'll just be very, very quick about to, to make sure everybody's on, on board here. We input our in fields, which are going to have mean energy density one. They're going to be uniformly distributed. We're going to divide them up into blocks of size B1 and solve those, and each one of them is going to output a residue. So we have N over B1 residues, whose characteristic length is 2 to the minus B1 times 1, the size that we started with. Okay, and the work of that is just how much work did we have to do on each of those individual sieves. Okay, the second stage that inputs those, those are going to be exponentially distributed, not uniformly distributed, so they're going to behave slightly differently. But uh, at least, you know, the first order, um, the, the exponentials all work out the same way. So I'm going to cut those into blocks of size B2, and I'm going to have a certain associated work for that level of the sieve. Now notice that there are far fewer um, number partitioning problems that have to be done at the second level. And so if we're going to balance the work at each stage, the block sizes B1 and B2 are not going to be the same. Okay, so that type of optimization um, is strictly mathematical, something that you definitely want to do if you're going to code it up, and that's indeed what I did. All right, so at the end of the day, after k stages, we've reduced our expected length by size 2 to the minus t, and so we want t to be around 400. That gives us our 10 to the 120 reduction in size that we expect, and the work is going to be just the sum over the work I did at each sieve stage. So to minimize the work, which is you know, how to find this optimum, uh, we balance the amount of work done at each stage. So we have sort of a equipartition principle, but now in workspace, whatever that means. Okay, so, so each of the safe state, yeah, sieve stage steps, wow, that's hard to say, um, they're going to have roughly the same work content, and that allows us to derive a recursion relation between um, what our block sizes are. Okay, and so... Uh, it turns out that this recursion relation is solved by, you know, something called the W function. Um, you know, and I, I didn't want to dig through the literature and actually try to figure out how to do something sensible, and so I just typed this into my, my favorite mathematical thing, which is SAGE in this case, and got it to cough out some answers for when I target uh, 400 bits of reduction in size. So size about 10 to the minus 120. All right, the number of sieve uh, stage steps. All right, I've got to find a new thing to say there because I just can't say that. Um, as it varies from two to eight, uh, I have printed the size of the blocks that we'd have to use. Um, so, for instance, if I want to get the, the job done with only two, two steps, um, the block sizes are going to be uh, around 200 fields, and that's going to be a pretty hard problem for us to do today. Obviously, it's not going to be that hard in sort of a cosmological sense, but it's, not, it's uh, certainly challenging on my, on my desktop. Okay, so, but down here, say four, five, six stages, um, these numbers really are not that big. Okay, so those are actually quite practical. Uh, two to the 54 work is challenging, okay, but certainly not impossible. Okay, so it's not, not too bad at all. So, in fact, uh, the amount of work that we used on the deep thought cluster for doing the Carmarker carp experiments, which I'll show in a second, was probably coming close to this. Okay, so, so on a cluster, yeah, not a problem. Okay, by comparison, Carmarker carp is just way better. The number of fields that are required in each of these sieves is growing quite quickly. Uh, Carmarker carp see, sort of slots in between a sieve with four and five steps uh, to produce comparable results, and its work factor is much, much less. Okay, so if I was just saying, well, follow dynamics, which has the best work, then that would be the algorithm to use. Okay, so whatever, whatever you can take away from that. All right, so yes. So um, I, just, I just wanted to say one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, for, because maybe people are wondering why we keep talking about the sieve if we seem to have something better. Um, <laughs> so, so the reason why we keep talking about the sieve here is uh, because while, as was mentioned in the previous talk, which is a more realistic model for mm -hmm. the CC than ADK, is a, it's kind of a lattice problem. Yep. And so if you're taking a look at something like Karma Car Park, which kind of only takes into account relative size to scalar, that algorithm, it, it's not 
quite clear how to adapt that algorithm to something like a lattice problem. Yep. But yep. the SIV algorithm are easily adaptable with lattice problems like this or potentially. So the point is that uh, the point is that even if this KK model, because it's specialized to a specific flavor of number partitioning, uh, only works with the ABK model, these, all of these, this experimental work that Brad and Stephen have done, uh, what it really shows is that even the slightly more realistic, or much more realistic, these opportunity model can be attacked here. The yes, these, these, the fact this sieve is derived directly from something called tuple sieve, um, which is a lattice sieve. Right. And in fact, one of the reasons we did this is because tuple sieve was, was probably beyond my capability of writing code. So we need to find a graduate student if we wanted to do that. I just know, no, okay. be realistic, right? So. Okay, um, right, so, so let me quickly run through the experiment since I'm almost out of time anyway. Uh, so we wanted to have a, at least one result that says, yes, we can attack full-size problems. So if I want to actually solve um, some sort of number partitioning problem that re produces residues of the size of the cosmological constant, then we can do that. Uh, it's going to take a sizable number of fields, somewhere around 800 million, um, but it can be done. So the, the mechanism to, to do this was we took our real numbers, uh, we wanted 400 bits of precision, so we, took, we generated integers of size 430 with a little extra slack to take care of round off issues, uh, wrote the code for it, and, uh, and ran it. It's a very, very simple, um, very simple algorithm. Um, after plotting it, we didn't get quite what we expected. Uh, so then we had to go back and figure out, well, what should we have expected? All right, so, so uh, I printed a theory curve on here, and this slide's a little bit busy, so maybe I won't go into it in too much detail. But the idea is that the output should be exponentially distributed. There's literature on that. Um, there's this constant C, which we thought, oh, that's got to be like 1 over root 2. Asymptotically, it is, but we're not there. And so um, what I can do is compute the probability of finding a residue of the right size, since that's what the experiment was, and plot a theory curve for that. That's relatively straightforward. And the results were, okay, <laughs> that's, that's fine. And so we're seeing that, yeah, okay, the, the Karmarker-Karp algorithm is producing things of the expected size, but even up at this huge range, we're not at the asymptotic value for, the, for, the predicted, for this predicted constant yet. It's just, just, we're just not there. And so we can't even make claims that asymptotically we should be, should be close. It's just, you know, there's the results. On the other hand, these sieves are a little bit expensive. And so just quickly going through here, um, I should have balanced these using the, this uh, equipartition idea, but I didn't. I just picked some sieve sizes, 20, 30, 40, 50, and a force a sieve and plotted what should have occurred, just as a proof of concept. Okay, and so here's the profile for it. At CIV stage one, uh, we're going to actually solve 60,000 problems, each one with 20 fields. Okay, and so the work from that is about 25 bits, so it's sort of comparable to, uh, well, it's, it's, it's really easy. All right, so there's the, the theory going all down the, the left side of what the sizes of the residue should be. At the end of the day, after four CIV stages, we should have shaved off, um, this is sort of my failure for picking two coarse numbers, I was aiming at 100 bits, and the theory actually predicted 121 bits off the size of the input fields. Okay, so, uh, good. Um, and so here are the plots of them. Uh, again, we see that early on, it's, uh, I mean, it's just, you can't see the difference between the, the model and the data, they're just right on top of each other. As the thing becomes a little bit coarser, at the very end, I'm only solving 50 problems, we do see a little bit of deviation for this one example. I didn't want to run a whole bunch of examples, um, well, simply because we wanted to get the paper out by that point. Uh, so in, the, in this example, we actually found something that was a little bit smaller than the, the expected residue, and the sieve ran, well, a couple minutes on my, on my Mac. So, we're certainly within the range where we could solve real problems if, if it came to it um, under the assumption that our problems are randomly generated. Okay, all of these are based on, on random um, statistics. If our, for some reason, in, in either model, we're generating data which is not random but has structure, 
then most of these models probably aren't going to work They're quite the same way. And, uh, and all bets are off. Not saying that we can't do it. It's just that uh, we'd have to revisit all of these theories. All right, well, I'm out of time, so uh, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions.